CBD Pod, the the left of the dial podcast. Uh, the, the Time Worm by my partner Richard Shirk brings hey. us in. And uh, how are you doing, Richard? Oh, we're we're great. We're really good. How are you? Um, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Thanks for playing that tune. That tune rocks. Um, I, I haven't heard it for a while, so yeah. Like, who is that? <laughs> for, I, want to, if, I want to buy that record <laughs> i totally forgot about that uh <laughs> and that, that's on my new album uh which is called uh with clairvoyance available on the internet <laughs> i i want to someday have a body of work where where i forget you know like oh yeah i, I did that that's pretty good yeah it's i, I want to i want to it, it's a fun feeling that. yeah that um if you record enough uh, albums and songs, you know, you just uh, they sneak up on you. Yeah. Conversely, you could you could happen upon something and be like, oh, man, that's not so great. That is not very good. Who is that? Oh, it's me. <laughs> and then so I guess I guess that's it can work not both disco ways. Duck. That's <laughs> that's a soft tag single. And that that can work both ways, I guess. But totally, not totally. not saying that not saying that that would be your 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 lot in life. But uh, but I guess if I'm thinking, you know, someday I'd like to have that where where it's just like I forgot about doing something, then I come across it. It could it could go either way. Yeah, there's some uh, some juvenilia in especially in my uh, my writing career that you know best left at the back of the closet, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's how you. That's how you learn, man. Yeah, and I. I guess uh, not. Yeah, I, I. I think a lot of us have been there, where where we look back on things that we did. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like sometimes uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll see a drawing that I made when I was a little kid or something like that, and be like, oh, that's pretty good, and that was that was me. So I guess you know. Yeah, me and. Uh... Yeah. Me and uh, Bob Dylan kind of have the same philosophy on that. It's like pretty much a no-win situation <laughs> that, <laughs> that either you look back on something and you're like, oh, I'm embarrassed by that. Or you look back on something and you're like, that was brilliant. Do I still have that that juice? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I, I just choose not to. I, just, I always keep, I, I'm always, you know, I'm, you know, Excelsior, like oh, always forward. So. Yeah, forever, yeah. forever onward. That's right. <clears throat> which right, brings well, us to our show, which is that's I, right. And correct me, is this show eighty one? It is eighty one. Yeah, it's right. uh, the the Anthony Carter um, of of the LTD podcast for, for those uh, NFL fans from long ago, huh. uh, Minnesota Vikings fans from huh. from way back. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the the first number I associate with the number eighty one. NFL is that the game where uh, those grown men are violent towards each other? Uh, yeah, it is oh, that not, one. Okay, that's the one. <laughs> well, show eighty one. Uh, what's this show? Is this show called Lust for Life? Uh, this specific show is called Lust for Life. So this is kind of a new format. Um, we haven't really, we've, we've done shows. We, we did, uh, the revisionist history shows where we talked about one album, uh, for a whole show. That's what we're doing, but this isn't really revisionist history. I don't know exactly what we're, we're going to call this yet, but, uh, but basically what the premise is, these are albums that, I, I think we're in agreement that uh, this this is a classic album, but it's not you know necessarily one of the um, you know generally acknowledged classics. Yeah, um, so we talked about the possibility of uh, Sean's awesome shelf. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, somebody hold my Walkman. Hmm. Um, uh, deep crate diving. Well, my, my original title idea, which was never, never really intended to go anywhere, but, but it was just like the first thing I thought of for a title was, Hey, that's a classic. I love it. It's simple. Yeah. It's to the point. It, it says what you want to say. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that might be it. It might be it because, uh, you know, there aren't strong uh, contenders here. So, you know, and if it works, I guess it works. You know, wh- who am I to say? Um, but, yeah, the album, uh, well, first of all, we're talking, you know, about an Iggy Pop album. Uh, and you, you've, you've listened to the show any amount of time at all. You probably know which one uh, I would be going with. Um but to begin with, we're doing this show at the time we're doing it because Ziggy Pop is now 74. He turned 74 April 21st. Happy birthday, Jim. And So a little bit, yeah. <laughs> happy birthday, Osti. I, I call him Osti. And, uh, and anyway, uh, a little, you know, slightly belated birthday. Uh, but last year for Mr. Osterberg's birthday, uh, we did a fantasy draft. And so you know, that, that part of it has been done. Uh, and I talk about the album lust for life all all the time. (laughs) And I know, yeah, you do. And, and maybe, maybe this will just get it out of my system (laughs) that we'll spend a whole hour talking about it. Um, or so, uh, it might be less, it might be more. Don't, Uh, don't hold back on your nerdery, my friend. Yeah. But you know, I I think it's just time to get it all out. Just, I, I love this album. We're going to talk about it, and yeah, that's that's the show. There you go. And, and uh, yeah, and uh, I, I I had some questions for you. Um, so I know how much you like this record, and um, and you yeah, I just I gave it a fresh listen today. It's a cool record, especially if you're into Bowie. Um, you know, if you know the Stooges, but you you want to jump into the Iggy Pop. Solo, solo, ouvre. Um, but I, I was curious, what's your what's your history with this record? How did you first come across it? Uh, that's a good question because I don't even remember at this point. Um, is it one of your older brothers? No, no, it isn't. It isn't really something that came from somebody else. Uh, it's just um, I, you know, I I know the first thing that i heard would have been lust for life and then i think i heard success um before having the album as well and so so those were the first two songs that i was aware of off of this uh by the way though conversely uh you, you know like many people associate this with the movie train spotting and it's because of my love for <laughs> lust for life that you know like when I saw the trailer for Train Spotting, I'm like, oh, I have to see this movie now. Oh, yeah, okay. And, you know, that's that's one of my favorite movies. So um, it's... Oh, yeah, okay, it, it, cool. It's, it's an album that's really done me well. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember exactly the origin of it for me. Uh, but i can say though that uh this this is definitely my favorite iggy album including any stooges any anything any any uh any part of his career this is my favorite iggy album for sure can i uh tell you a short story about how cool my mom is sure <laughs> so uh so yeah uh train spotting uh that came out what was that like 96 it sounds about right. Uh, ninety five, maybe ninety ninety five or ninety six. Okay, so I I was I was a, a youngster at that time. Um, I want to say like twelve, thirteen, and uh, my mom was in the middle of um, putting herself through school again. You know, she did the housewife thing, and then. She decided she's going to self-actualize and and uh, go get her PhD, which she promptly did. But she fell in with this really cool crowd of of younger people, and always had kind of like cool taste left over from when she was, um, you know, in the seventies, you know. Uh, and so, after I was home from school, she came home from her job. She's like, you know, I've been hearing about this really cool flick. We should go check it out. And it was train spotting. My mom took me to go see train spotting. That's how cool she is. <laughs> yeah, which which is definitely cool. Um, 
I, I wonder I wonder how like was she totally aware of the subject matter of the film uh, when she took you? Yeah, she knew it was about heroin addicts and uh, had a good soundtrack. Um, she's the kind of mom that when I was homesick, I remember her renting from the local uh, tape uh, rental place, uh, The Shining and Clockwork Orange. <laughs> so, yeah, and she's still cool. So uh, shout out to uh, Dr. Becky. Well, there you go. Yeah. Early introduction to Kubrick and, and, uh, and, and heroin abuse, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think my parents would have taken me to see train spotting, but, uh, I had a way of, of doing those things on my own. Were you like a Bowie fan before you knew this album or did they, did those two paths kind of inform each other? So I didn't I didn't really think of it as much of as as uh, having the Bowie association, um, you know. Like I've never really that's never really been that prominent for me. Uh, it's just really, you know, started with with uh, you know a couple of songs I really loved, and then finding out that the whole album was was just banging. Yeah, the the Bowie thing wasn't really so much a selling point to me. Like I, you know, because you don't you don't hear Bowie so much on the album uh, or anything like that. Um, so that wasn't really what led me there, but yeah, I don't know. Whatever led me there, it, I, it was right. You know, it, I, it's just circumstances. A lot of times it's just, uh, you know, fate or whatever. I think I might've happened into this album through Susie and the Banshees, maybe. Okay. Because because of their version of the passenger, exactly. Yeah, so I think that I was aware of that song before I was aware of the the original. Um, I'm thinking, especially back to the one and only time I saw Susie and the Banshees when I was 11, and uh, how much they blew my mind. And I'm thinking that that song and and so yeah i started to pick up Susie and the banshees records after that but uh that song specifically the passenger is uh such a haunting like we, we could do an entire show about the evocative interesting nature of the song the passenger but it really yeah really drew me into this record for sure and then into uh iggy pop and then finding out about the stooges uh, and kind of working backwards and then you know kind of years I, I was kind of a late bloomer on the album station to station but mm -hmm. uh pretty much every time that i put on a bowie record these days uh about i'd say about 50 percent of the time it's gonna be station to station and that i feel like that feel of bowie is what gets borrowed on uh the two albums that uh, bowie helped iggy pop make well, and, and just go to go back to the Susie and the Banshees version of the Passenger. It, I didn't hear that until I think quite a few years after I after I knew the original. Um, but yeah, to to the point of the two. Okay, so so just to put some context here, uh, the first two Iggy Pop uh, solo albums were the Idiot, uh, which um, and then then Lust for Life, the one we're talking about, uh, the Idiot. Uh, both of those albums are produced by David Bowie. Um, they, uh, you know, they they were collaborating for those years, but but very different albums, I think. And the uh, the Idiot really has Bowie's fingerprints on it quite a bit more than than Lust for Life. Um, I, I think you can say that uh, the Idiot is is well. The Idiot is much more of a Bowie album than Lust for Life is, and Lust for Life is definitely more of an Iggy album than than The Idiot is. Uh, and and you know a big part of that is just coming off of The Idiot. I think a lot of the attention that that he got for The Idiot was around Bowie. Um, so they so they did that album, then they toured off of it. Bowie's uh, in in the backing band on keyboards, you know, and trying to pretty 
be pretty obscure. Uh, kind of reminds me, <laughs> maybe this reference won't won't work for everybody, but uh, reminds me of like uh, seeing Ty Siegel uh, years ago, where Michael Cronin was was his bass player and very anonymous. And then then you find out you like you you find out Michael Cronin has his own album and it's amazing. Uh, but but in this case, Bowie was you know a superstar, and uh, and you know he's content to just play the keyboards behind uh, Iggy in his uh, touring band. Right. Oh, and hey, that's Keanu Reeves on bass. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, but but at the same time, you know, the press uh, was very focused on on Bowie's involvement in that album. And so I think that was kind of a driving point, you know, like uh, Lust for Life is kind of a, very much a product of friendly competition between the two, because I think Iggy realized he, he had to uh, take the reins a little bit, you know, and not in a bad way, but but just that, you know, I think the way that he put it was he had to be he had to be on. Well, not a quote, but to the effect of he had to really be on his toes because if he if he wasn't if he didn't try to stay ahead of Bowie, Bowie would kind of dominate the thing. So he he had to be, you know, he had to really be on his game in order to uh, make it make it more of an Iggy album. I've heard that, too. And yeah, the, yeah at the time, Bowie is just. You can't stop Bowie. Like he's he's nonstop. And uh, I yeah, remember, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know where I read this, but um, the they would when they were in the middle of these records, and Bowie's also um, coming off of uh, you know seventy five, Young American, seventy six, Station to Station, seventy seven, Low and Heroes, about how Bowie's working so hard that. They get back from they, they, they were roommates at the time too, Iggy Pop mm. and David Bowie in West Berlin. And getting back from the studio and being so tired that Bowie just walks open, walks over to the fridge and cracks open a raw egg and and drinks it and then goes to bed because uh because that's that's how hard they play. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, and then that that was basically you know, did, uh, Bowie didn't have the the best diet in those days either. So that's yeah, good. no wonder he's so thin, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. The thin white Duke was was just. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously just the raw eggs. <laughs> 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 the David Bowie yeah. diet: cocaine and raw eggs. Yeah, thin thin and pale <laughs> is not not exactly uh, you know strong association with with good health. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it uh, you know, I, the idiot's a good album too. Um, I, I strongly prefer, uh, lust for life. And I think a big part of it is just that, um, you know, like there, there still is this, this collaboration going, but, but, uh, you know, there's, there's two faces of it with those two albums and they're, they're both very strong, but, uh, you know, I, I think some people maybe prefer the idiot. I, I don't really know how that breaks down, but for me, this this is the album. And this album was released in let's see, August twenty ninth, nineteen seventy seven. Yep. And I don't think it charted anywhere. Maybe like low two hundreds in the in the UK, right? Well, it, it so it was golden in the UK. Okay. Um, in the US, uh, it was. It was released on RCA around the same time that Elvis died. So oh it, yeah, yeah. So it it didn't get uh, hardly any promotion because of that, and you know who knows what might have happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, really didn't just didn't get promoted. Uh, just horrible timing. A lot of stories like that in in, in you know music history. Uh, and you know, uh, the idiot was released. The previous year, 1976, and um, where where was this recorded? It has a, a really distinctive, like classic sound to it. Yeah. By the way, the idiot uh, actually was early 1977. Ah, wow. So yeah, a big year. Um, okay, so this was recorded in West Berlin. Uh, 
I think this was, you know, right after Bowie and Iggy. You know, like I think it was after the tour on the Idiot that they they moved to German Germany, and you know, which was. I, you, what you hear anyway is that it was an attempt to to get clean and sober um you know and and uh i i think that that that's part of the reason why you know things were so productive is that they were really focusing on on work um in a in an effort to to get uh sober yeah i've heard that too and um and yeah, kind of a interesting because Bowie at the time is huge. You know, he's still, you know, um, there is like maybe a little bit of a, a lull after Ziggy, but he is, um, you know, coming off of he, he, pretty much after Ziggy, never really wasn't a star. So to kind of read about their um, scrappy bohemian. Uh, roommate situation. It's like, hey, Iggy, did you take out the trash today or is it my turn? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so they're in West Berlin. Remember at the time, uh, Berlin is divided in half by the Berlin Wall. East Berlin is Soviet controlled. West Berlin is uh, Western and kind of a weird uh, frontier town in a lot of ways where uh there's a lot of poverty and bombed out buildings but living was cheap and so you have a lot of cool artists that end up showing up in berlin and eventually there's this studio in berlin called hansa ton studio uh commonly referred to as hansa and known uh by a lot of people as hansa by the wall because it was only i guess uh like a few meters away from the berlin wall and uh you can you can totally hear this studio because it's um it's a like a big meeting hall. So a lot of people call it uh yeah, the big hall by the wall. And um you can totally hear in, in how huge these drums are, especially mm. on the leadoff track, Lust for Life. Yeah, and and also, you know, like I I don't know if that's that's the reason for it, but you know, a lot of what what to me is so great about uh about this album is that it's really you know like if it if it wasn't for the fact that you are i mean you know definitely aware that you aren't hearing any audience noise or anything like that like it sounds like a live performance it doesn't sound like anything you can really do in a studio it uh you know it has that that raw emotion to it yeah and there's like a live reverb kind of feel and yeah, I, I, I'd love to learn more about how this was tracked because, um, yeah, I mean, it, listening back to it, it's like, yeah, they were probably just, you know, set up in the live room and, and um, you know, roll tape. Yeah, I mean, it definitely has that feel to it. It, it uh, you know, you can do this, you can have that kind of performance without a live audience. Uh in this is this is like a textbook case of of what you can do um you know what what kind of uh passion you can display uh even even if you're in a contained situation you know uh but yeah in in addition to the uh the studio it it also you know like Bowie kept the the touring band intact for for the sessions uh so you have Ricky Gardner, um, Tony Sales, and Hunt Sales. You know, and so those guys, and then Bowie on keyboards. That that was the touring band, and then they they stayed intact uh, to record the album. Um, then then adding uh, Carlos Al- Alomar on uh, some lead and some rhythm guitar, and uh, yeah, yeah. And these are all guys that carry over from uh, Bowie's backing bands at, at different points mm-hmm. especially carlos alomar yeah carlos alomar although i think carlos alomar um maybe uh, his role is a bit more subdued on this album than than really elsewhere because uh, i think he, he's definitely more prominent on uh, bowie stuff than he might be here i, I think he, he he 
jumps out on the last like three tracks, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's hard to say for me, you know, like what uh, what might be him and then what might be Ricky Gardner. But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess going to it uh, like like we did with the uh, <laughs> with the uh, revisionist history. Uh, do we want to pick apart the, the album album uh, art, the cover art? Uh, you know, I've uh, comparing the idiot and Lust for Life. Mm. I've always thought the idiot was such a cool album cover, and this one was like uh, not cool. <laughs> yeah, it. I think it's the same person responsible for both of them. But, Probably. It, it reminds yeah. me of, uh, you remember that big lawsuit in the late 70s or early 80s where um, I think there were a bunch of Phil Spector, John Lennon sessions that uh, were getting like a weird kind of official bootleg release. Mm. The, the album was just like especially crappy. It was um, like this really bizarre cropped head of john lennon on a yellow background i gotta find this on the internet <laughs> but it, it reminds me of that like you know mm. it, it's it's okay and I've, I've never owned this on vinyl too so uh yeah. i think the album art totally changes when it's um you know 12 and a half inches by 12 and a half in, inches rather than some dumb little postage stamp right yeah, it it's it, it just seems like a, a not very much thought out album cover. It's not particularly bad or anything. It, it's just like, you know, why why just uh just a mugshot basically. Um a black and white mugshot, you know, with a gold bordered uh yeah, it, 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 I I don't know. I don't know that, you know, Oh, yeah. So uh, the John Lennon album that I am referring to is um, John Lennon sings the great rock and roll hits. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a dumb album cover. I kind of love it. Um, and yeah, it was, I guess, <laughs> like the the source tapes for um, the John Lennon album Rock and Roll got released and then this was the album that uh, tried to get the the drop on the official album. And I think it was advertised on TV, like, call now, 1-800, blah, 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 blah. You can it does, it for only $5. Yeah, that title does seem like one of those. John, John Lennon sings the great rock and roll hits. It's super bad. Yeah. Uh, My, and the, the cropping of his head is just like very poorly done. <laughs> so Yeah, I would say by contrast, though, um, on the cover of Lust for Life, Iggy looks, you know, happy, chipper. He does, uh, and, and I like that. The, yeah, um, yeah. John Lennon on on John Lennon sings the great rock and roll hits. Looks very upset. He does. He, yeah. he looks like somebody really crossed him. Okay, I, I just posted the album cover to our uh, our chat room, and we've got. <laughs> oh man, chat's blowing up, man. People love yeah. this album cover. Yeah, yeah uh, people are are going one, to try and uh, take take advantage of that. TV commercial offer. Uh, one one listener is saying that uh, he's going to cut out the John Lennon head and the eyeballs and wear it as a mask for Halloween. And that could be done. All right. You have to go with, uh, you have to have a wingman who goes as uh, sweaty Phil Collins. <laughs> yeah. John, um, <laughs> I, I will say the cover of Lust for Life is better than the way <laughs> John better, Lennon. Way better, way better. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, uh, I like the, because if you know Iggy Pop, um, he has uh, a reputation. And to have an album called Lust for Life and him to be just like, hey, I'm Jim, you know, on the cover, <laughs> just like totally wholesome looking dude. Uh, I think that's pretty punk rock now that I think about it. Yeah, <laughs> could be. Um, yeah, it, it just, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't bear this much scrutiny. But uh, it could have been better, I will say. Could have been, could have been a more, you know, like maybe, maybe the album would have done, maybe it would have fared better in the states with a better album cover. But 
but you know, I would say the death of Elvis played a bigger part, really. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, the death of Elvis, uh, I'm going to have a quick trivia aside that Iggy Pop was once considered to be the replacement for Jim Morrison. That's why uh, if you look on the back of the album cover for, I think it's um, Raw Power, mm -hmm. uh, he's wearing a leopard skin jacket and his hair is dyed black. Yeah, well, it, the the Jim Morrison thing there. So I'm not a big Jim Morrison fan myself, but but uh, the one thing about Jim Morrison is I often think without Jim Morrison there wouldn't be an Iggy. Uh, so so when I think about that, you know, like I think uh, yeah, the Jim Morrison thing was not all for naught. And Ian McCulloch. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, so. You know, even it's it's a weird thing, though, because I think um, I think at least in the early days, uh, you know, even even though Iggy seems very iconoclastic, you know, and and, you know, very much his own person. I think, you know, if, if you could read his mind, especially in those early days, he just he would have been happy to be just a carbon copy of Jim Morrison, it almost seems. Which is so cool, because if you go like even one step back, Jim Morrison wanted to be Frank Sinatra. So like what is the, the influence of Frank Sinatra on punk rock? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's, Whoa. it's like two degrees of uh, two degrees of Sinatra. Oh, hold on. There's a book publisher in the chat. Who's just given us a contract to write that book? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, that's that's the funny thing, you know, that uh, you know, you really have to think sometimes what is originality, because I, I think you look at somebody like Iggy and think he's insanely original, and you know, and he and he is, um, but I, at the same time, I I think he was in a lot of ways just really emulating Morrison. And, uh, you know, and in my eyes better than Morrison, but, but, uh, but, you know, I, the, the, it's a, it's a funny thing when you, when you like, I would, I would use this as much as I'm an Iggy fan, I would use this, uh, to refute, you know, people that put too much importance on originality. I, I would use Iggy as, as a, a, you know, text textbook example of why originality might be a, quite overrated. I think there, there are a lot of really interesting uh, threads that, that all kind of route through Iggy Pop as a, you know, as a performer, as a person. Um, so not only the Frank Sinatra, Jim Morrison uh, lineage, but um, and we've talked about this before, uh, that it's really fascinating to to think about how much Iggy Pop has saved on laundry bills from not wearing a shirt. <laughs> we talked about this during a BG show about how like, oh, oh yeah, their satin jacket, you know, budget is offset by the fact that they didn't wear shirts for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. So good for you, buddy. Yeah, there you go. It all comes down to the budget. <laughs> Okay, so so tracking through now. Um, so Lust for Life. Uh, Lust for Life, uh, of course, the opener to the album, Lust for Life. It, it all, it's and all the, very... Such a, a cool kind of mission statement. Um, it, it's them on like this uh, quest for... Like my interpretation of it sometimes is like, okay, this is their like... Uh, their adventure into uh sobriety or you know relative sobriety or something so he there's that line about uh no more beating my brains with liquor and drugs it's like yeah okay um, yeah yeah and then along with that you have a lot of burroughs references which you know are somewhat lost on me um you know the johnny yen and uh hypnotizing chickens and you know all of that is uh from burroughs and you know it it's kind of hard to make sense of it without without any any sort of uh, baseline knowledge of of those references, but still works. You know, like it. it You'll find the answer in Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, but you know, the point 
point being that this, this song just rocks, you know, like this, this, uh, it would be, you know, I guess, I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll probably come around to to sequencing uh, later in the discussion. But uh, but I mean, immediately this this one just grabs you by the throat, you know, with the drums and and then the, uh, the bass line huge, coming in. Huge reverby drums. It's yeah, uh, just so classic. So one of the all time, you know, leading tracks on on uh, in the universe, the, the known universe. Yeah, um, definitely, uh, definitely a guide to how how to do things. You know, if you if you want to if you want to know how to record music, I, I think this is where you where, you, you know, this is one of the places that you start. Totally. And uh, you've got some great backing vocals by Iggy Pop himself. And um, I want to talk to you about the the just the, the rhythm of it. I mean, mm -hmm. do you have you read about the origin of the. Dun, 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 dun. yeah the morse code yeah yeah that it's yeah. uh the armed service television um like begin when they begin the broadcasting dun, 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 dun. so what i'm going to ask in the chat is um it's supposed to be morse code and i'm pretty sure it's long long short 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 long so the first person to uh, interpret that, uh, send us a chat, and I'll, we'll uh, send you. Uh, what should we send them? <laughs> uh, we'll send you a jar of vitamins. Okay. Yeah, a Liverpool FC scarf. Oh, that's that's promising some money there, dude. <laughs> I've got some spare vitamins I can, you know. But anyway. Um, Okay, I'm going to wait on the... Well, to say it's one of my favorite concert experiences, that's putting it in a still a big group. Of course, uh, but, you've been to a lot of concerts. Yeah, yeah but I, I saw Iggy uh, a few years ago at the Chicago Theater in Chicago, coincidentally. And, uh, you know, he had, uh, he had like Josh Homme uh, uh, leading his backing band. Really good band. And... Uh, and you know, just like the really long, you know, they they come out, they start out less for life, um, you know, really long intro, and and then Iggy comes out, you know, and and you know the song, like the song is in full full uh, go, and and Iggy comes out and bursts on the scene, and then you know runs out into the audience and all that, and it's just perfect. Oh, it's just cool. perfect. Yeah, I've never had the pleasure. Yeah, you should. You you still can. I mean, that's one of the great things. You, uh, hopefully, post pandemic, there there will be opportunities to see see uh, Mr. Osterberg live. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I, I would gladly do it again. Uh, but glad I glad I got to do it when I did, and it was it was a really cool thing. And he did a lot from this album, a lot from it, uh, and and a good amount from the idiot too. Uh, so it was a good good time to see him um it was a post pop de depression tour okay and uh yeah so i don't know lust for life uh we talked about train spotting already you know it uh it was enough for it was enough alone for me to want to see train spotting uh because of of the use of the song and and uh and and the uh, trailer and the movie didn't disappoint and uh was remixed for for uh train spotting 2 which was a really good sequel by the way uh I, I think a lot of people slept on that one it was good uh remixed and i'm not so much a remix person that that remix didn't work for me too well but uh an all-timer an all-timer yeah, I guess I'm not a uh, not a remix man myself, but uh, very hit and miss for me. Yeah, yeah, seldom hit. So uh, the text, uh, the chat, uh, we've got the second letter, which is a V. <laughs> That's all we got. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, good job, guys. You get A for effort. <laughs> C's get degrees. All right, and then uh, track two, sixteen. Um, you know, not not as great, but really good song. And uh, 
you know, and by the way, as far as the subject matter goes, I don't know. Things were different then. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. But yeah, and <laughs> and Iggs is not the only one to go down that creepy route. I mean, yeah, like, everyone, <laughs> including the Beatles, was like, "My girlfriend's sixteen. Isn't that? Yeah. Isn't that right. me? It's like, yeah. no, it's it's weird, dude. You're like thirty. What's going I on? don't. I don't know if that started with Chuck Berry. Um, certainly, I it did. yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly Chuck Berry certainly uh, made it a big thing. That's for sure, and and uh, continued v- very prominently into the seventies for for rockers. Um, Even Ringo, you know, and, and he's such a yeah. mild-mannered gentleman. But... Yeah, and and he made it all, sound all innocent and everything too, uh, with the way he did it. So yeah, if you are gonna All write right. that creepy song, um, like it's okay yeah. if if you're 16, but uh, subject matter aside, though, it it does rock. It it uh, it's yeah. another another good example, another good example of how to record things. It's another good example of uh, uh, being in the studio, but but getting results that are on on par with uh, a live performance. Yeah, this has some real like spontaneity to it. So, like, I was listening to it uh, today. I just I just, just listened to a snippet of it right now. And it's like, I think the band had the riff, and I think Iggy Iggy's been good at at being like, okay, I'm feeling this. I can just spit out some something yeah. that's gonna make sense. And well, and there's, yeah. there's some real magic in there. Yeah, that's that's accurate uh he he did improvise a lot of the lyrics so he would go in you know with like a bare bones idea of of what he would do lyrically but a lot of it was improvised um which i i don't know if if that was solely his idea at the time uh but bowie uh used that for heroes you know like the reason why you have a version of heroes you know the the single version that's so different from the album is that he was he was basically, you know, improvising those lyrics, uh, you know, so, so that was definitely something he was doing. He, he was, uh, he was going in, you know, like, uh, with what, what you might say are beats, you know, just, just like a skeletal, you know, an outline for what the song would be. And then, then improvise a lot of the lyrics around it. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I think it's kind of tradition for once in a show to be like, now, now, listeners, I'm a recording artist, and I want to give you some real advice. <laughs> so, uh, my advice is to to do that. Like, don't don't overthink <laughs> it. Just just go in there and rock out. Yeah. Okay. Expert then... advice that will that will uh, <laughs> take you far. Yeah. Uh, track three, some weird sin. Some weird uh, sin. Yes, please. Another strong, another strong rocker. I mean, really strong. And. Uh, Another another one I got to see him do live uh, from this album. Nice. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, um, really cool, uh, really underrated song. Uh, really, really overlooked, I think. But it's easy to see why that would be when you look at you know what's around it on this album. Yeah, and that the riff in that is the guitar riff is totally cool and. This is one where I'm, I, you know, I'm such a big station to station fan. Maybe that's kind of informing me a little bit, but for me, this has like a real station to station vibe. Like I, I'd, I'd love to just slot that in, you know, into the Bowie record. Well, you can do that, you know, with you, modern technology. With modern technology, you can do that. Yeah, man. All I right, put then... on a, put. I'll put on a cassette tape. <laughs> Then, uh, then the passenger. We've, the passenger, we've talked yeah, about yeah. it a little bit. Uh, the passenger music, music written by uh, Ricky Gardner, uh, incidentally. Good job, Ricky. Yeah, and uh, definitely a classic tune. Uh, we talked about the Susie and the Banshees cover of it. Uh, it's been covered quite a lot. Um, never as good as the original, in my oh. opinion. Uh, it's really hard to capture this, but, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it. Yeah, and just you know, just really cool chord progression. Uh, again, the drums, you know, like you have the guitar intro and then the drums come in, and it's just the energy is just perfect. Yeah, it's it, this is a real magic track. It's um, it's catchy 
and it's scary, um, kind of post-apocalyptic about, you know, ruined buildings and, you know, shattered glass and all that. And, uh, but in some ways it's, it's kind of like, um, like the nightmare version of, and we've talked about this before and during our, uh, spring tunes show the, the awesome subgenre of, uh, like driving in my car with my <laughs> elbow in the breeze, you know, like, uh, I'm driving around in my, my new automobile with the window down. And this is kind of like the, the nightmare that you have right. where you do that, but you're where you trapped pick up in the like, wrong person while you're doing that. Yeah. And you're, you're trapped in like, um, you know, like the New York from escape from New York or something, oh. you know, it's, it's just a scary tune, but it's, it's yeah. so pretty. And, um, it's, it's, yeah. it's dark and cool and easy to play too. So, yeah. uh, all you aspiring, uh, rock and roll people out there, uh, go look up the chords on this one. I think it's like, uh, you know, a minor F and, uh, D and C it's like, it's a super easy song to play. Yeah. I should have brought my ukulele to the recording studio. Just, um, yeah. just repetition of the same four chords over and over again. Uh, there's a slight difference in the repetition, but you can get away with just repeating the same. <laughs> it's cool. You know, as long as you're feeling it, man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it, uh, is, you know, and it, it, uh, there's, there's a high cool factor, uh, to this album, you know, which I often think is very overrated, but, but here, like if, if you want to really get to what I think is cool, uh, this is a very cool album, and and the passenger is maybe the peak of of the cool factor on on this album. I think. Agreed. Yeah, it's it's like I said before, it's magic. It, it's such a cool song. Uh, rely. I've I've heard this song, like probably like you have, Flick. You know, I don't know how many times, but it, it's more than a hundred. It's probably closer to a thousand. Uh, and I still love listening to it. And if I haven't heard it for a little while, I'll put it on, uh, listen to, you know, good, you know, good headphones and, and, you know, the hair stands up on my arm really does. Yeah. It is that good. Uh, okay. Then last, last track on uh, side a is tonight, uh, tonight, uh, definitely more, more of a collaboration between Bowie and pop, um, Bowie and Iggy, uh, Bowie even even uh, did this uh, in live sets in in I think like the eighties maybe into the nineties or maybe it was just the nineties. This uh, there's a I think there's a Bowie studio version of this, right? Uh, isn't this the title track for uh, his one on, of his kind of on old... one of his bad albums? Yeah, <laughs> From, yeah, yeah. You might be right. I don't know. Someone, yeah, someone had to say it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I I think you might be right. Um, and I think I I read somewhere, probably on Wikipedia, that um, Bowie eventually used I think four tracks from their collaboration on on his different albums, mostly mm-hmm. during his kind of like eighties, you know, nader of uh, whatever. You know. Yeah, I mean, there there was this one, you know, obviously China Girl. I can't think of what the other two would be off the top of my head. Yeah, mm, should have had that coming in. I, I don't, I couldn't tell you what those two are right now. I'll ask the uh, chat. And oh, yeah, someone, someone's cop, someone's, uh, someone's typing. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So side two um, starts with success. Uh, one of my favorite says, well, I mean, it, you know, this album's just so loaded, uh, but success is so much fun. So, so the energy so good. Uh, Duran Duran, we talked about it a little bit ago on, on their oh, yeah. cover album. They, they covered this and, you know, did a pretty decent job. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love this song. Uh, this was another really great live one. Um, the the call and response thing is such a good 
such a good uh, live um, thing. It's and... so funny too. Like you can, there's that one point uh, where you can like just hear him almost like cracking up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is. It, it's. Uh, it's another one of those things where you just you know see what the energy was like. Like. I don't know. You know, if, if they didn't have the right elements in the studio and then try to record something like this and have it just come off as uh, forced or, um, you know, false in any way, it, it would be uh, it just it would be a big disaster. But uh, but they nailed it. You know, it's just. Uh, it, you know, just I, I don't know, you know, like I. Certainly don't know, you know, like it, it isn't like now where they would probably have a video of of every single minute of the sessions. It would be so awesome, though, if, if they did have footage from these sessions. I, I would just be curious as to what the atmosphere was like. I think there were like, you know, a lot of crossword puzzles and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of downtime. Yeah, a lot of downtime. No, no, I think this was just totally fun for them to record. And yeah, the call and response. um thing at the at the towards the end of the song is just goofy and in a really cool way you can tell that they're buddies you know mm. and that's the thing about recording music like this is you know if you're friends if you're recording with people that you trust and they're your friends you're gonna get great music out of it and you can tell that they're friends and they trust each other yeah. and uh and it, it yeah it really comes across in this tune yeah, and and I would say so. So to me, like, what would make this album really perfect is if this was the final track. Like, yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah. Um, if if there's any flaw in this album for me, um, well, I I would say you know one, this track should be should be last, and then two. It, other than this track, I would say you know it's it's really front loaded. The uh, side a is just just really got it going on and and then side two is not not as strong but it, but uh you know I, I think it would look that much stronger though uh with just that little bit of resequencing yeah and, and that i think that's i'm kind of answering my own question is like why i don't own it on vinyl and it is the last three tracks which is one third of the album that just yeah. don't, don't really do it for me and we can group those together <laughs> like we don't need to go track by track on those i i think they're okay i think they're good enough and those uh, are uh turn blue neighborhood, neighborhood threat, threat and fall in love with me yeah which and, uh and... in my notes i have fall in love with meh <laughs> <laughs> meh but, but yeah you know, like <laughs> but the uh the keyboards on that are cool which are played by david boy yeah i i, I... <laughs> I agree. You know, like I, I think they're, you know, they're like on a on a lesser album, they would maybe be it easy. It'd be easier to look at them as stronger tracks. I think here, though, it's just like, yeah, this this is kind of losing momentum now. Um, yeah. And they they remind me of uh, like lesser 80s uh, Lou Reed tracks mm. in a lot of ways. And um, I guess. You know, other than liking, I, I like the the rest of the album before before Turn Blue, Neighborhood Threat, and Fall in Love with Me. But uh, one of my memories of with this album is that uh, I was working uh, super long hours on a movie years and years ago, and uh, it was one of those kind of like you know fun places where like they don't pay a lot so you get to have a fun office you know mm -hmm. and um and i shared a, a big cavernous office with a couple people and reliably when i would forget to turn off my music because everyone would be like oh can i put on some iggy pop and you know, <laughs> instead of like headphones uh you know someone would put on their, their speakers inevitably i would get up to get a coffee or something and then get pulled into some other thing and then come back and they'd be like, you know, I really hate that turn blue song by Iggy pop. And it would always be the one that comes on like the minute that I forget to turn off my, my, <laughs> so, 
So, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I don't really dislike these tracks. They're just not as strong. But, you know, here, here's what I think would fix it. If you take one of these tracks, you put, put it at the end of uh, side one, then you start side two with tonight and then you end side two with success. I, th I think you, I think then it really works better. I would recycle some Stooges jams, you know, because <laughs> Bowie's there. It's like the, hey Bowie, let's play some Stooges jams and uh, <laughs> put some keyboards on them. Let's do no fun. Yeah, yeah. So that it's a it's a really fun album, and um, I I'm not familiar enough with E's solo career to know if he's ever like come close to being this cool again. I, I mean, think he, it's, he's always cool, but I mean like yeah, consistently good record. I think kind of eluded him for a long time. Yeah, he he hasn't he hasn't I mean it's a, it's a lofty height anyway. Uh but no, I he hasn't. You know, like uh I think up up into about, you know, 1980 is is w like six well 69 to 79 so basically just you know talking about what we talked about last year 69 to 79 uh is he's he's just he's just on fire all the way through it uh 69 to 79 and and then uh 1980 it uh he's you know then it's all right and then then the 80s and 90s aren't very strong uh but you know he has a nice comeback uh in later years Okay, so uh, our listeners are asking, uh, let me read this. Um, okay, they're asking, if I like The Idiot and I like um, this album, Lust for Life, what, is there another solo record to go to after these two? Well, the, uh, the Iggy and James Williamson album, uh, if, you, if you consider that a solo album, is that Kill City? Yeah. Okay. That's a really good album. Okay. Well, uh, there you there you have it, uh, our anonymous listeners. Uh, and can we can we do just a quick recap of how awesome the Stooges were? Well, quick. Um, yeah, we we are uh, a little strapped for time, but but yeah, I mean the Stooges were great. Uh, the, I mean, so this is the funny thing. This is the thing a little bit different for me than you, I think. I think you really like Funhouse. I really like uh, the Stooges and Raw Power. Those are my, you know, that's how I rank them. That I go um, the Stooges, then I go Raw Power, then I go Funhouse. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, all, you know. All great yeah. albums, though. All great. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you're, you're Funhouse first, right? Or do I have that wrong? No, Funhouse totally rocks, and um, you know I, I think they're so Stooges. If you were to write the two sentence uh, blurb about them, is that they're an obscure band from the Midwest, they're from Michigan, and they kind of sort of invent punk rock while everyone else was uh, doing kind of like their hippie thing, right? Yeah. And uh, they go on to influence. And they scared everybody. <laughs> they scared everybody. Totally intense. Um, kind of sort of fell in with Velvet Underground in a way. Um, but then the, the bands that went on to be influenced by Stooges are all the, you know, it's like the founding class of punk rock. Yeah. And by the way, just a quick mention, you know, just as far as the other uh, other solo albums, uh, New Values from from 1979 is also a, a good album. Um, you know, like I said, 69 to 79 guys just just as, uh, you know. Putting out banger after banger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's our our look uh, might be called. Hey, that's a classic. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, it's a good good one to kick it off with, I think, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's uh, an album it's, I, I love dearly. Yeah. yeah, thank you for picking this one out. This has been a lot of fun to talk about. And 
Uh, before we wrap up, uh, would you like to tell our listeners about what we're up to next week on show 82? Yeah, it's the show that we previewed a, uh, a show ago um, that we were going to originally do this week. But it was Iggy's birthday, so made an exception. Uh, but but uh, songs that uh, are musicians that are that hit our funny bone. So don't uh, don't be in the mindset of like novelty songs. Uh, it's not the aforementioned disco duck or, uh, you know, stuff <laughs> that you'd find on Dr. Demento or or that sort of thing. It, but you'll see. You'll see what it is. Can I? I, I, I think uh, just to kind of give my perspective about when uh, my friend and co-host Flick uh, put this to me, I, I was immediately like, no, I only like serious <laughs> music. But then, you know, I, I, I think about what music I listen to. Mm. Um, you know, I, I lo- we both love Jonathan Richmond. We both love JoJo a lot. Yeah, don't, songs... don't give away too much of what we'll be talking about. No, but well, I, I just want people to know that we're not going to be like jamming on They Might Be Giants for right. an hour a lot of really cool bands. Uh, you may not think about it, but they have like a real hel- element of um, humor, satire, or absurdism. And so that we're going to kind of uh, jam on that rather than the the goofy stuff. Yeah. So that's uh, that's coming up next week. Right on. And uh, Sean, it's. Uh... Always a pleasure to hang out and talk music with you. Uh, And thanks to our listeners. Um, Again, I'm Richard Shirk, joining you from Mercury Capsule Recording Studios here in Oakland, California. Yeah, and this is uh, Flick in Des Moines, where it's uh, in the 80s today, so yeah. Okay, there you go. We're going to work on your studio name. (laughs) So until next time, buddy, uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you next week. Overnight.